Okay, let's look at the two chapters side by side because these are two very hard chapters, the prostitute chapter and the destruction of everything chapter. Uh, Chapter 17, Babylon is the great harlot's lies, its religion, rides on the seven heads and ten horns. That's all civilizations have had religion. All political leaders have used religion. It's the mother of harlots and of abominations. Religion is Satan's domain, uh, and, it, and it's just filled. It says all the demons are very much at work, drunk with the blood of the saints. Uh, all the religions are involved in the persecution of the truth. They want to suppress it. Then we get to chapter 18. It's Babylon, the great city's idols. So we have the great harlot's lies, religion. The great city's idols are materialism. And we see kings and merchants and those that trade by sea, all the business people, and they're all tied together in this. So basically, Satan's two deadly offers are he either hooks people with religion or he hooks them with materialism. And Jesus was constantly confronting people with this. He's, by the way, back in the airplane. We landed just like that. I had just written my name and phone number and handed it to the doctor. He was an anesthesiologist of a very large practice going big game hunting. That's what rich people do. And scared to fly. And so, and his housekeeper knew he wasn't saved and I could tell and he was a Roman Catholic and didn't understand salvation. So I shared the gospel. I handed him the track and we both had to catch close connections. So I ran off the plane waving at him and he went the other way. Six months later, I was speaking at a different place. And I was walking between services, uh, speaking at this church, looking at my notes, and someone was in front of me, so you know how your peripheral vision, so I kind of moved over and I kept walking, they moved over, so I moved over like this, and finally I looked up, that great big smile. His first words to me were, hi dad, it's been hard to find you. I said, you're the getting the bottles of alcohol on the airplane guy. He said, and he said, did you know what happened? I said, I would love to know what happened. He said, I took that track, and he said, I went around the corner to the first bank of those seats they have nailed to the floor in terminals. He said, and I got on my knees in the airport and read your little paper you gave me. And he said, and I cried out to God. And he said, I got saved. And he says, I tell people that I actually heard about God at 36,000 feet. And he said, but I didn't get saved until I fell on my face, you know, and and called on his name in the airport lounge. And you know what? I had the privilege of baptizing that fellow. He actually came to the church where I was speaking, and at their next baptismal, he told that story about how the Holy Spirit had to hit me over the head with a baseball bat because I wouldn't even look at him. I turned my back to him. And see, if you really mean business with the Lord, and if you really do this, I'm here, use me, I'm offering myself, watch out. He takes you up. And he'll open opportunities for you to share the gospel. So Jesus often shared these words. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world You have all the pleasure, all the possessions, all the power, but you will lose your immortal soul. We know that verse. He goes on to say, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Do you think you can pay? You pay for your sins? No. Divine Revelation says only a perfect sacrifice. See, salvation is what an amazing plan God has. God became a human so that he could live a, the only perfect human life because we need credited to our account perfection because we are not perfect. So Jesus did that in 33 years. Along the way, he's growing in knowledge and wisdom, in favor with God and man, and starts speaking for three and a half years and then hangs on the cross for the second half of salvation. The first half was living the perfect life. The second half, dying the perfect death. On the cross, God the Father, how do I know that? It says in 2 Corinthians 5, and this is King James, to wit, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That's how Paul put it in old King James, to wit. That means to to understand. God was actually in Christ looking out through him at 
the world and the sins of the world and punishing Jesus like he committed all the sins of the world. Remember he said, behold the Lamb of God, John the Baptist said, that taketh away the sin, that's singular, of the world. What did Jesus die on the cross for? The totality of the mass of the sin of all the world. Is everyone going to be saved? Did you remember the little tree I showed you, the denominations, and it went, you know, Roman Catholic and all this, and it went over here to the Presbyterian, and then it went to the Universalists? Did any of you notice that branch? Did you know that the, the theological drift of Reformed theology came in Prague, Czechoslovakia, to be Universalism? Do you know what that means? They said an infinite God made an infinite sacrifice for all sin, so everyone will be saved. That's logical, but it's not biblical. But it is logical. If an infinite God paid an infinite price for the sin, singular, that's the totality of the mass of the sin of the world, then certainly he should let everybody be saved. That's logical. But it's not true. And Jesus said as much. I mean, Jesus said, most of you that think you're saved aren't. That's Matthew 7. He said, it's not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, but those that do the will of my Father in heaven. And so Satan's goal is for us to exchange God's plan for thinking we can earn it ourselves or enjoy and not worry about it by passively neglecting 